good evening ladies and gentlemen i am komal the moderator for this conference call before we begin with i would like to extend my warm welcome to all of you for joining us today the management we have on board with us mr vinita galwal managing director and mr ashish tiwari group cfo at this moment all participants are in listen only mode later we will conduct the question and answer session and if any participant has question can use raise hand feature in zoom call and wait for his or her turn please note that this conference is being recorded i would now request mr ashish tiwari to embark on this meeting thank you and over to you sir thank you komal and uh, good evening to all of you again uh, for joining us today to begin with uh, we would have a earning presentation uh, followed by the question and answer session for uh, presentation i am inviting mr agarwal over to you sir thank you thank you ashish and thank you komal and uh, thank you to all of you to joining uh, today's uh, earnings presentation for tci for quarter 4 by fi22 um it can we go to the next slide ashish please the last year has been quite eventful for us uh, we know that in the country as a whole there have been uh, trends in terms of overall growth and uh, some buoyancy has been there but in the last few months we've seen that there has been a certain amount of disruption that has happened because of the war in ukraine or subsequently now the uh, the the uh, lockdowns in china and etc so supply chains across the world are still quite disrupted and uh, um i was just sharing with someone the other day the uh, the it's so basic that if you think about today we were ordering some printers and i got to know that uh, some of the components of those printers are being made in the border of poland and ukraine um, and because there was disruption that component has not come and now printers are not being able to be made in india so it's just that now supply chains have become very very intricate um they, the the thought is always that uh, as they always says that your supply chain is as strong as your weakest link so so given that uh, circumstances we are in a very dynamic situation um however the company has done reasonably well um in this period and has been able to deliver good results next slide please Uh, i think a lot of the industry growth drivers remain the same for some of you who have joined us for the first time uh, we think that uh, there are uh, let me just quickly mention some of them the consumer driven trends that are quite visible from omni channel based uh, experiences to high degree of uh, urbanization which is leading to different kinds of logistic solutions uh, this is a big trend and uh, this affects almost all companies and i believe uh, as it has been said that in the pandemic a lot of the trend got accelerated also uh, so this is a trend that will affect logistics industry for the next several years quite aggressively on the customer side as we are seeing that uh, the uh, the changes because of consumer side because of all the disruptions they are also looking at uh, a lot of areas of how they can manage their supply chains many customers are now moving from just in time to just in case uh, which means that building more additional warehousing spaces or ensuring that there is some uh, flexibility in their supply chains and they are looking to outsource more and more as we say speak uh, clearly the the fact that they are adopting technology uh, and uh, simultaneously asking us to also adopt technology is very very positive Uh, so in this dynamic scenario we are seeing a lot of uh, interesting opportunities from customer side also where they are looking to outsource more and more of their logistics industry is very fragmented and the growth there is uh, is extremely uh, directly linked to the overall gdp growth but uh, the share of the market that we have is increasing as um, things are becoming more and more uh, formal um, and i'm uh, also alluding to the next point in terms of the regulatory aspects clearly infrastructure is a big thing uh, in terms of the government's push and we think that that will help us really bring down the logistics cost overall 
and the 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 prompt from the government is very clearly move to multimodal um they are doing as many things as possible to ensure that this shift starts happening so that uh, the overall logistics cost uh, starts coming down uh, the pli schemes and also the uh, trends towards atmanirbhar bharat means that a lot of uh, new opportunities are also emerging for companies like us um i will talk about a few uh, going forward uh, as a company we are usps are uh, the fact that uh, next slide please that we have a very strong uh, uh, customized service base this base of cust uh, of services that we have been able to create internally means that we are able to uh, really address all aspects of customer needs internally uh, we are able to outsource things that are not too strategic also sim uh, simultaneously uh, the the benefit for customers have always been that we can uh, really provide them an end to end solution we provide them a proper visibility across the their supply chains and ultimately economies of scale also we are working with many many sectors providing them all kinds of solution uh, all over the uh, country uh, of course there are aspects that uh, we are providing which are uh, technology linked which i am going to talk about subsequently our multimodal network this is the other usp that we have has become very strong in the last few years uh, you are aware of the fact that we have uh, our own three uh, trains we added one this in towards uh, at the end of march uh, we also do a lot of other movements the overall rate movements came down a little bit uh, because of the fact that in fy21 there was a, a shortage of trucks etc because of the pandemic and a lot of cargo moved towards rail this has come down a little bit and uh, but uh, the trends are very obvious that uh, at at this point in time we are loading close to four trains a day uh, as we speak the coastal network is uh, strong uh, that has delivered and we have our own 8000 containers and uh, in fact ordered some more containers in quarter 1 of this year as well in terms of container management uh, we have all types of containers that we move from uh, domestic to international to uh, chemical uh, marine containers and so on uh, and that volume has increased in the last year we of course manage uh, 55 yards across the country these are uh, multi purpose yards for uh, automotive uh, carrier uh, automotive companies mostly could be in all segments of automotive we also manage uh, 60 terminals across the country move work across 60 terminals uh, across the country also we are incubating as i mentioned several areas uh, in terms of uh, long term uh, potential uh, i have talked about in the past the chemical pharma agriculture supply chains these are going through a lot of uh, changes and uh, the demand for organized companies like ours has been increasing we are seeing good traction towards uh, renewables uh, for example uh, india has a very high thrust towards uh, um, let's say solar uh, market so building the solar market so we are seeing a, a huge movement in terms of renewables uh, we have uh, very specific capabilities around renewables from providing uh, customized rail movement to warehousing storage facilities including some areas where we have dedicated terminals also for some companies um this is one area through the pli scheme and atmanirbhar bharat is where we are seeing good amount of growth coming in uh, you are also aware about our cold chain business as well as the sark business that has uh, again high potential in the last year we've seen sark including bangladesh etc grow very rapidly and uh, we are now providing quite detailed uh, a quite a comprehensive range of services there including the including providing rail services directly into bangladesh uh, so avoiding all the traffic that is there at the border uh, check posts in bangladesh um so so it, it all of these strategies of incubating these high growth segments are really playing out uh, as we speak uh technology uh, i think i do not need to mention but we are at the forefront of technology we have a very strong team developed a lot of tools etc um api integrations is now very very common we are building that with customers and suppliers 
uh, including building control towers uh, for customers. So again, technology-wise, uh, we are moving in a very rapid pace uh, as we speak. So these are some of our USPs of the company. Uh, in the last uh, fiscal, uh, in the last quarter, I would say Q4, the growth has been flat because uh, the base, Q4 base was quite high. Um, there was a lot of pent up demand last year, which was reflected in Q4 of FI21, which we did not see this year. Uh, there is uh, a lot of liquidity available with us. We've been able to pay off uh, all our loans uh, from uh, at the beginning of the year, which was at 230 crores. We had only at about 42 crores, plus we have about 60 crores plus uh, cash uh, as well. So net debt is uh, minus uh, 20, 25 crores. And of course, there is a very strong pipeline of customers that's available right now. <clears throat> I'll take up now specific divisions. Uh, I think uh, I don't need to mention about the industry, uh, but uh, the freight business has uh, grown in the last year. Next slide, please. Uh, with, our, with our key account management system, as well as uh, the fact that uh, there is a robust demand for uh, freight services across the country. Our LDL business, as uh, we've been saying, has picked up and uh, has now reached about 35% of uh, the overall business for the freight uh, segment. Uh, one uh, important development here is that we have crossed 20% ROCE in terms of uh, this is something that uh, we've been saying that the business will deliver in the next uh, uh, as, as this ratio of FTL to LTL starts changing. Uh, so I'm quite confident that going forward, the, uh, the EBIT margins that you see here, the uh, ROC margins will remain at this 20 plus level. Uh, also, uh, in terms of outlook, also there is, of course, because of freight rates being higher, but of course, there has also been a volume growth uh, since uh, we've grown by almost 20% over the full fiscal. The trends remain uh, uh, buoyant. We've acquired some large contracts here as well, uh, which are both FTL and LTL contracts, uh, combined contracts which uh, would mean that we should uh, definitely look at a 10 to 15% top line growth uh, and the similar kind of growth in the bottom line this year. <clears throat> in terms of uh, our, just go back Ashish. Supply chain business uh, has uh, of course uh, a very wide range of services that we provide and a real, um, uh, comprehensive way of uh, how we are able to address to client needs. We have a lot of capabilities of managing distribution for customers. We have capabilities of managing large warehouses as well as yards. Uh, and on the automotive side, extremely uh, one of the largest, in fact, the largest in terms of automotive logistics in the country today. Um, the, uh, the yards that are there are about 55 and we are able to provide a hub and spoke system for many customers and do a lot of interesting uh, uh, value additions for them across uh, the supply chain. Uh, specifically, we are also quite focused on the EV space and we are seeing good results there. We are doing work for several companies and uh, uh, where we provide not just movement on the component side, but also on the FG side uh, directly to consumers as well. Next slide. Uh, the, the division grew last year in Toto Ford because of the shortage of semiconductor chips. Uh, as we know, it has been uh, affecting the industry quite a lot. Uh, but on the full year basis, we've had a moderate growth. Uh, we've also been adding new customers and some of that benefit of new customers will come across in this financial year. Uh, our storage uh, capacity has also increased with customers to about 13 million square feet of space and about 130 cubic feet. Uh, so this year we do expect this business to do a lot better. Uh, of course, the disruption of uh, semiconductors, et cetera, will possibly have an impact uh, for some more uh, period, maybe another few months. But uh, we are hopeful that there is a, already a pent up demand and that should translate into better uh, business for us. So yeah, in this business, we're looking at an excess of 15% in both top line as well as bottom line growth. 
On the sea waste side, our capacity remains the same. Uh, we've not been able to add any more ships because of the very high asset prices that are there. Um, so we are uh, on the lookout for new ships, but it has been quite tough. Uh, however, the business has grown tremendously in the last uh, quarter, as well as, of course, in the last uh, full uh, year, uh, doubling, it's uh, more than doubling its EBITDA margin, uh, as well as uh, with a very high ROCE. Uh, we've been going to Myanmar, as I've been saying in the previous calls, quite frequently. And uh, even now, there are some voyages that are planned, but it is a little intermittent from the government side also. Things tend to slow down a little bit in the first uh, quarter because of monsoons also. But uh, but uh, the, the Myanmar business is supposed to re be retained for the entire year. Uh, so we hope that we are able to capture some of that uh, and deliver similar kind of returns in this fiscal also. Um, we are we have planned for three dry docks uh, as we did in FY22 also. In terms of the joint ventures, uh, the Concord joint venture B grew by about seven percent. It was mainly, as I said, the base was quite high. We had grown at uh, more than uh, sixty uh, percent uh, last to last year, seventy percent actually. Uh, so that uh, uh, base was high, and hence. The business also had shifted from uh, road to rail in FY21, and uh, now it has come back uh, to some extent to uh, road. But uh, a lot of customers that uh, shifted uh, have also permanently shifted to rail. So this is a business, as I've been saying, has a high potential, and uh, we, we look forward to its continued growth. The cold chain business has recorded a, a very high growth of about 62%, although from a small base. Uh, the trends are quite positive and we do expect it to grow uh, as well. As you also are aware, in FY22, we, uh, we had Mitsui and company come in as a 20% partner in the joint venture. I'm sorry, I have a power outage uh, where I am, but I'm sure you can hear and see me. <clears throat> The Transystem joint venture uh, is uh, uh, has grown also by about 30%. And of course, profitability has grown there. Uh, this is a very focused automotive logistics company for Japanese clients. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a snapshot of the growth uh, on a quarter on quarter basis. And for the full year, uh, for the full year, console uh, revenues are up um, slightly lower than the, uh, the standalone levels. Uh, profitability at an EBITDA level is uh, almost uh, same in both the console level and standalone uh, level, uh, but about 40, 450 crores in terms of uh, console EBITDA. Uh, again, these are all-time highs uh, for us. The profitability, of course, is close to 300 crores, uh, almost doubled in the last uh, year uh, at a console level also. Uh, so overall, uh, the profitability and business has been quite uh, good in the last year. Thank you. Um, certain numbers, certain numbers, as you can see, in terms of console profit after tax, etc., uh, has been showing uh, has shown a twenty nine percent CAGR. Uh, yes, you can discount a little bit of this year's exceptional results, um, and uh, but the growth still remains in the excess of twenty percent. ROC, of course, has crossed 20% overall. Um, again, if we moderate it a little bit, perhaps uh, uh, 20 odd percent uh, is, the, uh, is the more reasonable number. This year, uh, we've, been, uh, uh, we've increased our dividend payout ratio and trying to edge between the 15 to 20% range uh, in terms of payout. So the uh, the overall dividend uh, percentage is at 300%, but it remains under the 15 to 20% uh, range of uh, payout. Our uh, ratings at Crystal, etc. Have all, have all been reaffirmed, and we remain uh, in, in our industry amongst the highest uh, uh, at double A positive. Our... Uh, In terms of ESG also, we are quite focused uh, 
and we have been able to uh, or start orienting our businesses towards uh, ESG norms. And uh, if you just uh, Ashish press one more slide, I think it's on. Yeah. Uh, we have been uh, doing a lot of uh, movement on uh, CNG vehicles, as well as ensuring uh, some amount of uh, movement of clients towards uh, multimodal network, so which will reduce their greenhouse gas emission. Um, as a company, we are very strongly focused on governance and our social aspects uh, in terms from our TCI Foundation initiatives. The outlook is uh, uh, looking at some headwinds in the short term because of inflation and all the disruptions, but we are hoping that um, these will start moderating out as also government spending has started to increase. Uh, we are uh, giving a guidance of 10 to 15% on the top line and the bottom line. Uh, if you recollect the first three quarters of the last financial year, we had grown quite well, but then we still, still kept the the growth uh, momentum levels uh, in terms of revenues at uh, 15 to 20 percent because we were expecting the q4 of fi22 to be slightly uh, lower and we sort of came up to that range uh, also in fi22 uh, fi23 we think that uh, maybe the first few uh, months will be a little tighter but over time this will start picking up and we should look at a 10 to 15 percent uh, growth uh, the budget has been carried forward from the last two years. Um, this has been a little unfortunate on our end because we've not been able to find the right ship for us at the right price. Uh, we have now even increased the budget for us, uh, moved it from, you know, in the past it was at 60, 70 crores to 80 and now to 90 and we are willing to go up to 100 crores also if we find the right uh, vessel. Uh, there is a planned expenditure on, uh, on the other aspects of, uh, some trucks and rakes, perhaps some containers, and of course, uh, some uh, land and building that's under construction. So looking at a, a possibly about 300 crores of uh, CapEx in this financial year. Uh, so we'll be happy to take any more questions. Uh, thank you again for joining us today. Thank you, sir, for the valuable insights. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin with the question and answer round. If you have any question, please use raise hand feature in the Zoom call. I request you to start with your name and organization name, followed by your question. So the first question is for Mr. Ravi Naredi. Sir, please go ahead. Naredi Investment Private Limited. Sir, what margin we may think for financial year 23, first and Second, this 300 crore capex you are uh, want to do, which uh, sector you will do? That is my question, two questions. The capex, as I said, uh, uh, there would be about 120, 130 crores of capex that will go into uh, the shipping related business, which includes the ship as well as the containers. Um, uh, some amount of uh, capex will happen on trucks, et cetera, which are essentially replacement vehicles as well as some new contracts. Uh, and also we are planning for uh, maybe one or two lakes also. Uh, so predominantly those are the sectors that it will go for. There's no capex going into freight business. And what margin we may expect in financial year 23? So I, I would think that the margin structure should remain uh, almost the same. It might come down a little bit in the sea-based business, but overall we think it should uh, possibly remain in around the same levels. So top line growth, we may assume 20, 20, 25%? Or uh, no, I think uh, we are giving a guidance of 10 to 15%. 10 to 15%. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Nice and all the best. Thank you. The next question is from Ms. Shalini Gupta. Ma'am, please go ahead. I think you'll have to unmute Ms. Gupta.
Yeah. So you can hear me now? Yeah, yeah, we can. Okay, so what I was saying is that uh, there's a high, very high possibility that that economic uh, growth throughout the world slows down. Okay. And sh should that should that happen, we are also expecting crude to fall off, uh, to to come off. So once when when crude falls uh, comes off, then at that time, uh, do we pass on the entire benefit to the clients and to vendors? I mean, how does it happen? Sure. So our contracts typically have fuel escalation and de-escalation clauses built in. And typically the contracts are like, you know, a 5% escalation and then the uh, rates uh, change. So uh, that's how we'll it will happen if there is a, uh, if the fuel prices fall down also. So there's a formula typically, and there's a trigger price that trigger that happens after, let's say a 5% escalation or de-escalation. So, so it's quite uh, simple in, uh, in that sense. Uh, yeah, so I mean, if if crude were to fall uh, fall by more than say ten or fifteen percent, because given given how high it is, it may well fall to below hundred dollars. Uh, so then, do we not see a pressure on our top line? Uh, no, not too much because that uh, the percentage of fuel as a component of the freight varies. In different contracts, it could vary from 35 to 50 percent. Um, so yes, there could be some fall in terms of the uh, the the overall um, the billing that you're doing to customers. But uh, we, as I said, you know, some portion of the growth comes from revenue from uh, inflation, price inflation, and some uh, part comes from volume increase. And we are quite confident that there would be some volume increase, and that and. Hence, we've also, that's why I factored in a 10 to 15% revenue growth and not a much more aggressive number. Okay. And so my last question, so most of the CAPEX has gone towards hub centers and warehouses. So I just wanted to check like what percentage of hub, hub centers and warehouses do we own? And similarly, do we own all the yard areas that we use for the supply chain? Uh, we own about a million to two million square feet of space across the country, but, uh, and in terms of the yard areas, no, we don't own the yard space. We hire and lease them uh, from uh, various vendors. So, so yes, uh, and these have been strategic in nature for us because we feel that there are some facilities that we need to have for ourselves. Uh, they also became become showcase facilities for our clients. Um, that's one. And secondly, in some places, uh, our, uh, for our freight business, we require uh, uh, hub centers. And those are uh, some of the older ones have become quite uh, less, uh, quite uh, small in terms of capacity. And hence, we needed new facilities. So uh, this is an ongoing uh, kind of investment that's happening. Okay. And so would you like to disclose the tonnage in the three businesses? No, we don't have tonnage specifically because see our business is not based on tonnage only. It's based on uh, um, uh, value that we provide to our clients. So, so we don't share that number specifically. Thank you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. The next question is from Mr. Krupa Shankar. Sir, start with your name and organization name followed by your question. Please go ahead. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, can you be a little louder, Mr. Kripa Shankar? Uh, we can't hear you as well. Right. Um, this is better. This is better. Yeah. Uh, you're breaking up. Uh... Yeah. Um, let me try. Uh, I think. I think. Uh... Uh, let me just try asking my question. Yes, try break up in between. Uh, we can't hear you uh, so well. Shall we come back? Maybe you can join back in the queue. Sure. Thank you. Komal, we'll take the next question. Yeah. Sure, sir. Uh, the next question is from Mr. Yash. Sir, please go ahead. 
Oh uh, hi, am I audible? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I think you briefly highlighted this, but my question was on the seaways business. So this year we have had an exceptional year in the seaways business. Uh, so how do you see this panning out in the next year? Uh, I mean, do we can we uh, can we maintain the FI twenty two run rate? Uh, you know, grow from this base and. Uh, what what would be the margins like uh, like this year they were higher but what would it be like the next year yes so i think uh, it's a challenge uh, for us to uh, retain the same margins uh, going forward uh, we are confident that some of these international voyages if we are able to make them we should be able to keep up the volumes as well as the margin uh, but i would possibly consider a, the, a little bit more flattish kind of uh, growth in this business in this uh, fiscal uh, because of some of these uncertainties and the fact that there could be uh, some some pricing should all, would also come down but we also hoping that in the, the the latter half of the year we are able to add uh, the new ship and once that gets added on we should uh, build on capacity but that's an assumption right now because uh, as as i said earlier the ship prices are still very very inflated uh, and we are um, possibly uh, going to keep looking out for the best alternative so uh, we would maintain on the top line and margins would be a little lower that's right uh yes i would factor that in yes uh, okay and the second one again so we have increased uh, our budget on the ship from uh, 70 to 90 crores odd so how are we looking at the payback period then i mean previous previously versus now or is the payback period extended or no since the freight rates have gone up the payback period has not extended um and um, you know when we calculated it two years ago of course since then freight rates have gone up quite substantially the container rates um so we we do think that it is still uh, possible to get the payback in the typical 6 to 7 years to 8 years uh, depending upon the size of the ship Got it. Thank you, and best of luck. Thank you. Thank you, sir. The next question is from Ms. Pooja Nagar Se. Ma'am, please go ahead. Ma'am, please unmute yourself. Hello. Yeah, can you guys hear me? Yeah, 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 please. Uh, yeah. Uh, audible. Yeah. Yes. All right. Okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, one question. Uh, uh, somewhere in your past interviews, you mentioned that there is a visible shift in the rail business, uh, and because of I think that the the, uh, the corridors that are coming up. Uh, can you elaborate more on that, and how do you see the landscape changing because of that, and how PCI could be taking advantage of it? And just to add some context, right? I think. Uh, uh a gateway district parks for, for example in their calls or other such uh, providers are are uh, visibly seeing a lot of potential there and seeing a lot of uh, chances of high growth because of additional service that they will be able to provide uh, so how can cci take advantage of this uh, right so yes uh, you know the dfc coming up and uh, just the fact that rail infrastructure is uh, getting developed at such a fast pace um as well as the focus is there on rail infrastructure development uh, including the announcement of 100 pm gati shakti rail terminals by the railway ministry these are all indicating that the modal shift is very very critical the government is pushing uh, very hard uh, for that to happen so there will be uh, growth in that uh, infrastructure and hence uh, the availability of providing more services uh, for example there are some companies who have started a roll on roll on roll off service already on the dfc on the western corridor uh, from uh, uh, from the outskirts of the ncr to uh, palanpur uh, just it's a start where your truck uh, gets loaded on to the train itself as it is and gets off so, so like this there will be other such services that will evolve in the next few years um, for us the uh, we are the people who provide the end to end the door to door solution and that's very critical because Uh, we don't need to necessarily own the infrastructure to run these uh, these assets but we need to ensure that we have the customer uh, with us and that is the uh, the focus for us and we are able to then deliver to customers 
irrespective of wherever uh, uh, and whatever mode they use. So, so that's our advantage. And I think uh, uh, for us, the DFCA sector will also be very, very beneficial in the, in the long run. Uh, one more question. Your uh, guidelines for 23 are uh, assuming that you get the ship and uh, 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 and then there's a pickup in the economy in the late now. In case uh, that doesn't materialize, are we looking at uh, a flattish kind of a year going ahead? No, I think uh, we've factored in uh, a ship possibly in the uh, fag end of the year. So we don't expect uh, a lot uh, of revenues coming in to this business, uh, overall business with uh, the new addition. However, uh, we do expect the other businesses also to start pick, picking up. For example, the, the supply chain business should pick up as automotive, logis, automotive uh, growth will happen in the country uh, as the ship, as the chip prices, chip availability. So, so uh, we think the other businesses will catch up uh, as well, even if uh, we're not able to add uh, a capacity, additional capacity. And of course, you know, general slowdown has an impact, of course, uh, but I don't think uh, we will possibly be at 0% uh, uh, growth. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. All the best. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And sorry for the goof up for in the name as your name was being showed as Puja Nagar said. The next question is from Mr. Abhishek Singhal. Sir, please go ahead. Hello, am I audible? Yeah. yeah. Good evening, sir. Thank you for the opportunity. My first question relating to why you are planning to raise funds from non-convertible debenture of bonds and where to utilize this fund? Right. So this is an enabling resolution that we have taken. Uh, we do not have any uh, immediate need to uh, add any more funds. But uh, uh, this is an enabling resolution we've taken for the next two years. In the event uh, that we have to raise additional funds, we are uh, we have the capability and the capacity to do that. We don't have to go to the shareholders uh, uh, at that time. Okay. And second question, what is EBITDA margin expected in FY23? Is 14% or down? Uh, we expect it to be a little bit more flattish or slightly lower than uh, in the current year. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. The next question is from Mr. Kipa Shankar. Sir, start with your name and organization name followed by your question. Uh, uh, hello, am I audible? Yes. yes, yes. yes right. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. A uh, uh, couple of questions from my side. So as you pointed out earlier, uh, that the ship addition is expected by end of uh, FI22. So, sorry, FI23. Given that, uh, you know, the capacity with respect to DWT would be much higher, are you penciling in uh, uh, a substantially higher growth in FI24? Uh, that would be my first question. So this will depend upon when we are able to add the ship, if and when we are able to add the ship. Uh, certainly, then we will uh, factor in a higher growth rate for 24. And uh, it's it's uh, is it fair to say that uh, you know earlier we had a plan of adding a ship every 15 to 18 months i think uh, does that plan uh, still hold true going ahead i wish I, it was possible because uh, but the asset prices are so high right now um, and i talked about it in the previous call still uh, what it was uh, 3x uh, of the prices we paid 3 years ago um, it might have come down a little bit, but still there's just no capacity available. I think what's going to start happening is that um, the second half of this year, we will see new capacity coming in. The larger ships are going to start coming. In. Once that starts coming uh, in, we'll see that some of the smaller ships, the kind of market that we are in for, uh, will possibly be available. Uh, again, this is all uh, speculative uh, based on the, the fact that you are able to, you know the war might end sooner. We have But the supply chains become a little bit more streamlined. So all of these factors will play uh, heavily on when we are able to acquire. And if that trend starts, then yes, we will look at uh, 
uh, at least um, 18 months, 15, 18 months to uh, uh, that period for acquiring new ships. Understood. Um, I mean, the second question would be on uh, L the LTL segment, the freight segment specifically. Uh, just wanted to understand that uh, the confidence we are getting on the growth side, 10 to 15 percent on revenue and EBITDA, is it is it more led by an organized or organized shift given the uh, focus increase in compliance, or is there uh, a, a sort of a, a branch network which is uh, driving our uh, growth? It's a combination of both. Um, in the LTL segment, clearly, as you rightly said, uh, some amount of shift, shift that is happening towards formalization, uh, and that is helping us clearly. We also have a very strong brand name across the country, so I think that also helps. Uh, and rightly so, the network effect is also playing out where we have uh, um, a large number of branches across the country with a proper hub network. We are adding, in fact, more branches uh, based on when new growth uh, areas are coming up. And just to cite an example, there is a new airport coming up in Jever in um, in uh, in UP, and uh, we've opened an office over there. Um, or if there is a new industrial township that's coming up, we are opening offices there. So all of these things will certainly help in uh, the network uh, expansion. Will certainly help in in um, in business growth as well. Um, so. You did uh, mention that you have won a large contract with uh, respect to FTL and LTL together. Um, just wanted to understand if, um, is there more of an integrated contract coming in because we are pro uh, available across the entire logistics value chain? Are there more contracts coming in for the FTL and LTL because of this reason? Is that something to which we can look at? Or? Absolutely, absolutely. I think the, the fact that we have options for customers uh, certainly helps us to sell those options and then drive the uh, the contracts in that direction also so so it could be comprehensive enough to not just cover a specific division but multiple divisions also so that's the kind of uh, contracts that we are now uh, working on and we do have some of them so so yes i think this is a uh, they, these are some important trends that are quite visible uh, in domestic supply chains. And is there a number or contribution of integrated solutions to our overall revenue, something which can give us an indication as to how the shift has happened with respect to uh, customers preferring more of an integrated player? Uh, well, you know, it's very difficult to give that at uh, specifically. I think what we tend to do is that uh, depending upon uh, certain businesses, we assign them to certain uh, divisions uh, based on their capabilities and then we are uh, constantly looking to uh, optimize that so so in reality is very difficult to share that number right now and last question from my side bookkeeping question uh, just wanted to see the depreciation on uh, the cvs business has gone up sequentially quite substantially in fact uh, just wanted to understand what would be the reason given we have not added a ship as well Ashish, can you answer that, please? Yeah, so Kripa, basically uh, what has happened, we have uh, did a kind of a reassessment of all the ships and uh, there is a, a sort of reduction in the useful life and therefore uh, uh, that component actually appearing as an increase in the normal uh, uh, depreciation. So Ashish, this would be the trend going ahead? This would not be a trend uh, going ahead. Uh, this is a kind of a one-time uh, exercise. Of course, the assessment is necessary uh, in all layers, but uh, it need not be uh, kind of culminating into uh, that higher depreciation every year. Got it. Uh, thank you. I'll get back in the queue. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, sir. The next question is from Mr. Alok Des Pandey. Sir, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, hi, this is Alok from Edelweiss. Hi, Vineet. Hi, Ashish. Hi, Alok. Yeah. Uh, two questions from my side. One, uh, you know, you, you meant, there is a slide in the PPT which shows about how the share of LTL has uh, gone up over the last four or five years. Uh, I just wanted to understand that uh, even as the focus on LTL continues, what is the strategy in terms of owning trucks? Because I also see about 65, 70 crores of capex being allocated to trucks and rigs. So, uh, is uh, is it going to be predominantly lease truck uh, 
model or uh, are we going to buy more trucks as well? The freight division has uh, virtually no trucks. It has uh, very few trucks that are operating mainly for specific cargo like overdimensional cargo, etc. But otherwise, all the trucks that we intend to buy would be for our supply chain division. So here, yes, the model is completely outsourced. Okay, so the LTL share going up then should drive up the margins uh, logically in that uh, segment, right? Yeah, well, because there's no, you know, EBIT margin and uh, EBITDA margin is almost the same uh, because there is no depreciation, virtually no depreciation and uh, no interest cost also since uh, the division has uh, is almost uh, using no working capital. Sure, sure. And uh, the second question is on the uh, supply chain uh, division. Uh, there, uh, can you give some color on, you know, uh, some sectoral uh, split in terms of which is the largest uh, client sector there? And uh, also, you know, I mean, uh, given the fact that you mentioned 30 million square feet of area, uh, that number seems to be quite high. Is it because it's, it's largely for auto, auto sector or uh, how should we read that? So the, the business split is 75 to 80 percent of the supply chain businesses um, related to the mobility segment. The mobility for us means, uh, Ashish, if you can go to the slide 15, please. Mobility for us would mean uh, we do work in the four-wheeler, three-wheeler, two-wheeler, commercial vehicle, earth-moving equipment, tractors, all of these. So passenger, industrial, and agri-mobility is what we focus on. And uh, so that is a predominant component components of this business. Other than that, of course, we do a large scale warehousing for our clients and the warehousing numbers that you see is not of automotive only, but of course, of others as well. We, we do, we run largest, one of the largest warehouses, uh, uh, the largest warehouse for the, uh, for an FMCG major, uh, the largest uh, high tech warehouse for a, a consumer durables company, um, also for other uh, food uh, based companies. Uh, across the country. So all lots of different kinds of uh, areas that we are running warehouses uh, for our clients and just not specific to automotive uh, only. So Vineet, is there a strategy to then, uh, you know, to expand your share or wallet share in the non-auto or non-mobility uh, sectors? Because uh, that's where I think, you know, a lot of people are seeing a lot of growth as well. See, we've been also doing a lot of work on the retail side. Uh, we run fulfillment centers for some of the e-tailers uh, e as well as some of the apparel companies, for example, have added a line in their warehouses for e-commerce as well. So yes, you're right that there is a lot of growth opportunities that are coming up and we are we have the capabilities and uh, the knowledge base to do it. We just want to avoid um, any kind of revenue buyout uh, that happens because there are a few companies that have either come in as uh, with IPOs or planning to come in with their IPOs and uh, or are flush with cash uh, and they are uh, basically doing revenue buyouts. Uh, so we are trying to avoid uh, some of that and trying to ensure that our, uh, we are able to stick to our margin goals. Uh, that is very critical for us. Sure, sure. Uh, understood. Uh, thanks a lot for your responses and all the very best for the upcoming year as well. Thanks, Alok. Thank you. Thank you, sir. The next question is from Mr. Omkar. Sir, please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, this is Srinivas from Mirabilis. Uh, yeah, hi, Vineet. Hi, hi. Hi, hi. Just a couple of uh, questions. Uh, firstly, you mentioned in your opening comments that uh, you won uh, some bit of new business in the uh, supply chain. Maybe if you could expand on it to the extent uh, you're comfortable with in terms of types of uh, new clients or new business lines that you're opening there. That's uh, and and if say the industry grows by X, uh, then based on the visibility that we carry, what could be the delta growth for the division, say the next year or so? Sure. So one of the models that we've been able to develop with a specific client who's in the EV space is uh, not uh, delivering it through a dealer network, but delivering it directly from the factory to the consumer. Uh, what we typically do is pick up that uh, unit from the factory, uh, take it to a hub, to a, a hub which is close to 
some customer to basically hubs across the country. Uh, we do a certain amount of uh, charging of that uh, unit. We do some PDI pre-delivery inspection. We get the RTO uh, certification done also um, because you know RTO can you can now do the registration of those vehicles online as well. So we do all of that and then finally deliver that vehicle directly to the home of the consumer. Um, now this is a unique model because an automotive uh, uh, unit getting delivered to the home of the consumer is absolutely unique. Um, so this we've been able to create a, a network for the, this uh, uh, company and they are able to utilize this very effectively. And then subsequently we are also have a lot of capabilities on the component side. Uh, we do JIT just in time logistics for many companies. We do um, the uh, milk runs, etc. And we are selling those uh, opportunities also to these clients uh, as well. Uh, so this is uh, an idea of uh, how certain models are getting evolved in, in the mobility space itself. Um, so yes, so that, that is uh, quite uh, interesting. Uh, the other thing that you just mentioned about uh, the growth in industry, I think you know what has started to happen as I mentioned earlier is that there is some revenue buyout that's happening. Uh, and some of our competitors are doing that. So uh, there could be a higher growth in the marketplace, but uh, maybe we are not able to keep up to that because we are trying to protect our margins. Um, so I would not venture out to say that we have a higher delta over the industry growth, uh, but I think to keep up with industry growth is what we are planning, of course, and wherever possible uh, enhance. Uh, so it, it will be very strategic for specific industries rather than just generally uh, everywhere. Okay. And uh, the second point is uh, maybe uh, if you could comment uh, beyond the auto as to what are the things, how it is evolving in the uh, supply chain and what kind of growth have we had beyond auto in the uh, supply chain this year? Uh, again, we've added uh, capabilities around chemical logistics. We are doing quite a lot of work around there. Some of the retail customers uh, we've been able to add, uh, as I said, also add e-commerce uh, capabilities for them as well. Uh, we've added uh, a few warehouses uh, and few areas in the FMCG space. We've uh, we've got uh, for FY23 also some new contracts that will possibly start later half of the year. So the pipeline remains strong in the non-auto space as well. Uh, and of course, that's a clear-cut focus also, given the fact that there is a higher dependency on one sector okay okay great yeah uh, the uh, next question is on the supply uh, sorry cold chain uh, this year has been quite stellar in terms of uh, growth though the business itself is still uh, evolving and remains uh, kind of uh, uh, small but broadly what have been the drivers of if you were to kind of rank it in one two three or so what are the drivers of growth for this business and how how was it more opportunistic or uh, structural in nature in terms of how we are addressing the business? Where do you see it say after two, three years? Uh, Ashish, can you change the slide, please? So uh, what uh, has happened in cold chain is that uh, the business uh, with uh, joint venture partner coming in has become uh, also uh, quite attractive to companies that were possibly on the fence when they, they were uh, looking at our business. Now they realize that there is a high degree of uh, professionalism in the business. There is a high degree of uh, um, uh, the, the services are very high quality. And that has driven some of the changes that have happened in cold chain in terms of our growth also. We've been able to capture businesses uh, in also in, on some of the uh, dark kitchens that are there or some of the, um, the quick commerce businesses, a little bit of that. But also just generally the business uh, market has started to mature and hence we are able to get some clients. We of course have done some pharma logistics also, some vaccine logistics and uh, all of that has uh, helped overall. Going okay. forward, uh, the growth should remain strong. Uh, of course, not at that 60-70% uh, that we saw last year, but uh, definitely I think in the next three years, we should be able to double the business. Okay. Great to hear that, uh, Vineet, and uh, congratulations on the financial performance as well as uh, my compliments on keeping up with all the emerging trends in logistics business and uh, you know, working with the new age uh, 
partners and business uh, businesses were well, okay fine thanks shrinivas thank you all right thank you shrinivas thank you sir the next question is from mr alok sir please go ahead hi uh, good evening uh, am i audible yes hi alok hi uh, so uh, sir just had a few questions so one was on the uh, cva segment uh, so you know uh, with the with the share of cvas coming down um, because uh, you know we uh, because of the share prices we have not been able to add uh, so how much the margins could go down uh, from these current levels because current level margins are more driven by the cvs segment <clears throat> so is there a possibility that we go towards the 11% sort of a margins or uh, would we be more towards the 12 12.5 um you know i think uh, i would not warrant an increase in margins for sure um, but i would uh, also not uh, discount the fact that margins will go down a lot so which means that i think uh, it could go down uh, because of the fact that there will be possibly uh, changes in the cvs side of the business um but uh, our other businesses should hopefully catch up uh, as well uh, so i think uh, we should possibly uh, remain in this range that uh, that we've been talking about rather than very very specifically uh, giving you a indication that it will go down substantially so i do not so the i think the shorter answer is we will not go down to last year's level um but we will not uh, go down go higher than what we are today got it and uh, so since you have been highlighting about a lot of issues with the uh, not just uh, see uh, as in the ship prices but also the geopolitical issues so so how confident are we that you know the ship could come through in in this financial year because it's been almost like you know one and a half, one one and a half year since we have been uh, looking to add uh, we understand that it's it's not really you know something that are out of uh, control but uh, you know this are we really confident that it, that it happens in this year or uh, there also could be some further delay you know because of multiple reasons uh, you know i this has been very frustrating for us as an organization that we've not been able to add capacity and uh, unfortunate uh, as you know as the situation is uh, globally it has had an impact on our businesses uh, on on the global rates and you know we were not expecting uh, in the earlier part of the financial year i think of fi22 we were thinking more related to covid disruptions but now clearly we have seen it's beyond covid it's gone to the war it's gone to um, other aspects of supply chains so so it your guess is as good as mine i think you know we all have to plan for this but uh, um, but we cannot also buy ships at exorbitant rates because it will put pressure on uh, our uh, margins over the long term Uh, so that also we have to be very very careful because um, these uh, these ships um, over a ten year cycle is what we need to look at in terms of the returns rather than just what you're getting today and tomorrow. Uh, sure, just one last question. So uh, particularly on this CV segment only. Uh, so you know the asset values are much higher than what we would have bought the ships at or you know uh, earlier. Uh, so even if we were to close a deal in FI twenty three, the prices would be higher than what it was before. So these margins or return ratios which we have made on these uh, ships in the past, those are like not happening even if we were to buy the ship now. But the rates have gone up, right? Yeah. So the the container rates have also gone up. So we are also factoring that uh, uh, as well. so so that's why the the returns that you get uh, the by the payback period remains the same with sli- slightly higher it. and its uh, rates uh, yeah please yeah slightly higher yeah. cost of the asset and slightly and slightly higher uh, returns on the freight rates 
Sure. Uh, just last question. Uh, this uh, freight rates uh, continue to be elevated or have we seen any kind of uh, stabilization on that? Some ups and downs. I think a little bit of seasonality is also there in this. So on the uh, uh, coast, we see that there is uh, um, uh, monsoons, et cetera. So that has an impact a little bit in terms of demand. So, but, uh, but more or less stable. Got it. Got it. Uh, thank you and all the best, sir. That's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. The next question is for Mr. Dipesh. Sir, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hi, sir. Uh, Dipesh from Equity Securities. Uh, thanks for taking my questions. Uh, sir, uh, the e-invoicing, as I understand, has been made compulsory for all companies with turnover greater than 20 crores from 1st of April. And some of the competitors in the LTL space are very bullish on this, the shift that it can cause to organized players. So just want to understand your opinion. Are you seeing any such shift that is happening? And what are your growth assumptions for the freight segment? Okay, so, you know, there are two separate questions, I think, broadly, one on the e-invoicing side. And yes, the effect is there on the LTL side of the business. But predominantly, I think, um, generally, FTL businesses or the other businesses also require e-invoicing. Uh, desperately. I think the customer adoption rate is very, very low. Uh, they do not, they do accept e-invoices, but they do also want physical simultaneously uh, with the physical PODs. So this is a very uh, vexing problem because this just increases our, uh, it is increasing the kind of uh, effort that everyone needs to put into ensuring that we are able to get uh, uh, a faster turnaround in terms of the billing systems. And we have been talking to some customers to see if we can uh, do API uh, uh, based uh, integration through ERPs so that we are able to share the bills uh, uh, electronically. Hopefully that will start happening soon. Um, so, so yes, it will help uh, over time, but customer adoption has to happen. On the LTL side, that's a shift more towards the formalization. So as uh, there are companies that are forced to really uh, look at eBay, are using the eBay bills, uh, are getting into the GST network, will have to move to e-invoicing and hence have to really move towards the formal side of the economy. And I think those are the things that will help the LTL business also. So, so yes, there are two aspects of the invoicing uh, and both positive for companies like us. So, sir, you think that the LTL will grow faster, like 15-20% growth rate because of these and measures that the government has taken? Uh, yes, our LTL business will definitely grow uh, at that uh, at a faster clip. Understood. Uh, secondly, uh, the 13 million square feet that you manage, I just want to understand, uh, will it be possible to share how much is the uh, the managed space on the client location and how much is actually leased by you? And is there any difference in the two uh, things that you, if you can point out? Uh, no, it will be very difficult to uh, share those numbers. Uh, we have various... Uh, uh, you know, we have owned facilities, we have client man, uh, client rented facilities, client owned facilities, um, uh, completely third party facilities. So very, very difficult to break this up into specific uh, uh, numbers. But there, is there any difference in the margins, so to say, when you have your own leased facility or you're managing the client location? Not always. See, I think what happens is that um, if you have your own facility, sometimes you have also the risk of uh, it being empty uh, between two clients. Uh, if you have a lease facility anyways, you have to take the cost. Now the, as per uh, the AS116, you have to factor the asset into your books. Uh, if there is, uh, uh, in many cases, if there are very large facilities, we actually create a transparency between the customer and us and say that, look, the rental is not where we want to make money. We want to make money on the, uh, services, the value added services, uh, because ultimately the client will get to know what the rent is. Uh, it's not too difficult to hide it. In certain uh, shared facilities, of course, uh, there is uh, some benefit uh, from uh, uh, from sharing that rent uh, between clients. Understood, sir. Thank you and so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. This will be the last portion of this earning call. The last question is from Mr. Kripa Shankar. Sir, please go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Thank you for the opportunity again. Uh, 
just uh, one question. So I did notice that uh, the decline in the farm segment was one of the key reasons why revenues uh, in supply chain had uh, come off. Uh, so just what you get a sense. I know, uh, you know, Vinith, you don't provide uh, segmental data, but can you specify at least that what would be, is it is farm a substantial portion of automotive revenues which we report? So, uh, you know, what happened was the, the UP elections and the elections in northern states, um, the typical subsidy that happens to farmers to buy tractors and so on and so forth, that came down uh, or they were stopped completely. So the, uh, that resulted in lower volumes that were moving through the system. And hence, uh, as you can see, uh, an effect on uh, the overall uh, mobility sector. But it's, it was uh, very specific to the timing of uh, the elections. Uh, but, uh, but of course, it's not an extremely large portion of the mobility sector, but it, we do a lot of work for the tractor companies, their uh, other ancillary equipment along with it. We do yard management for them. We do spare parts management for them. So yes, uh, it is uh, uh, an important segment for us, but not substantially large. Understood. And uh, one last question. I just also noticed that uh, the cold chain business is uh, predominantly asset heavy. And uh, when I look at the overall industry, uh, covering uh, some of the peers who are in the cold chain business, the ROCs are uh, sub 10% in this space. And it's it's been uh, such a case uh, over the years as well. So what sort of a uh, target ROC do we have on the cold chain business, uh, given that we are seeing a large opportunity? And uh, if, if you are going to focus on fleet addition, wherein the yields are relatively low vis-a-vis uh, storage side, uh, how do you intend to uh, you know, get uh, the desired ROC number? Yeah, that's a very interesting observation, uh, Prakashankar, because uh, you're right that uh, a lot of our competitors have uh, grown because of asset addition in the cold chain business. And hence, the even the return on the ROC, uh, return on capital is extremely poor. And years on years, that has been there. And hence, when we sort of started this business, and in the last few years, when we've accelerated the growth in this business, we've particularly key, uh, kept uh, careful consideration into how much capacity, uh, how much capacity should be owned uh, versus uh, leased and rented. You know, in all our businesses, we've seen that a, a, a combination of owned, leased, rented, et cetera, uh, spot hire basis always works and has worked quite well. This is the exact strategy we are also following uh, up over here. Uh, you've seen that, you know, the capacity that we had in that the capital, employed, rather that uh, we had was about 38 crores, the FY21, and has grown to only 42 crores in FY22. So really if the addition in capital employed is quite uh, less but the profitability has gone up from 50 lakhs to 2.8 crores. So substantial jump in ROCE. And this is because we've been able to leverage the, uh, the uh, assets better by having a combination of uh, various uh, more um, uh, models rather than just one of ownership. Got it. Uh, that's very helpful. Thank you and all the best. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now I hand over the floor to Mr. Ashish Tiwari for closing comments. Thank you, Komal, and thank you all of you who are uh, taking out time and joining us today. Uh, and I wish you uh, all the best and uh, stay safe and uh, take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.